The 24 Shades of Blue Cold Case Edition series is about real ongoing homicide investigations. The following conversation may be disturbing to some people and is not recommended for all ages. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to 24 Shades of Blue Cold Case Edition. I'm your host, Andy O'Brien. On Saturday, December 3rd, 1988, at approximately 7 a.m., Toronto police responded to a 911 call at Colburn Lodge Drive, where they attended to 28-year-old Richard Moore. He had become a victim to a stabbing and sadly passed away from his wounds shortly after arriving at the hospital. Hey, everybody. Sitting with me in studio to discuss the case is Acting Detective Sergeant Steve Smith, the Toronto Homicide Unit. Hey, Steve. How you doing, Andy? Good. Always great to have you here. And... Uh, our job is to dig into some of these cold cases to bring some of these murders uh, to justice. And I appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks for providing us the opportunity to showcase some of our cases and get the uh, get the information out there in hopes that we can solve these. My pleasure. Let's kick this off and talk about, you know, Richard and what was he doing on the day of his murder? Yeah, so Richard Moore, the victim in this uh, case, he was 28 years old. Um, he had some mental health issues. He was doing the best that he could do. He was living out in Queen West. He had temporary jobs. He was working with a temporary agency that was finding him jobs jobs that he could do as a as a laborer. So he was going out on a daily basis and making himself some money, um, being able to to facilitate his lifestyle with with the money he was making through work. Um, the night of the the homicide, it appears that after work, Richard had decided to maybe go out and uh, and imbibe in a few drinks. So he, he was out in a few different places that we know about. Um, in a few different bars up and down um, in in the Parkdale area. We, the last time he was seen was just after 10 o'clock in the evening. He was seen with a female leaving uh, leaving one of the bars and, uh, and walking out onto the street. I guess the next obvious question is what uh, led to Richard's body being discovered? So December 4th, 1988, there was a, a male that went out for a bicycle ride in Hyde Park beautiful area to go for a bicycle ride in the morning. It may have been a nice day. He bicycles into the park and doesn't he find Richard face down in the park? Um, he wasn't, didn't know whether he was asleep or whether he was deceased. Obviously called 911 emergency services arrived. They actually did an emergency run with Richard trying to get him to the hospital. But unfortunately he was, uh, he was deceased. And what items were found at the crime scene that you recall? So the murder weapon was left there. He was obviously stabbed. He was stabbed a number of times. Um, his cause of death was stab wounds to his chest, but he was stabbed a number of times all over the torso and the weapon was just left at the scene. So it was just disc discarded there. And then Richard's wallet was found clo in close proximity as well. And we're going to take a look at some of the pictures that we have from the crime scene. Um, we're going to discuss them a bit more in depth. So... The first picture we have up is the roadway, I guess, that was um, taped off. You want to just get into a bit more detail about uh, what we're looking at here? Yeah, so you can see the park on the north side of the roadway there. You can see the officer's vehicles just down in the uh, command center that would have been set up in regards to the murder. So this is probably an area where Richard may have walked down with whoever he was with that night and walked into the park area where... He was later stabbed and found deceased. And the next picture that we're going to look at here is uh, it outlines Colburn uh, Lodge Drive. You want to talk a little bit to this picture? Colburn Lodge is actually the address that was used in regards to this homicide. So that's the closest street area. Obviously, it's into High Park. And you can see back in 1998, it wasn't as dense down in that area as it is now. There's a lot more condos and uh, buildings that are down in that area that have been built up over the years. So it was a bit more of a secluded area as in regard to traffic on the streets in the areas, whereas now there's people all over that area at all times of the day and night. And right here... Um, let's talk, this looks a little bit more like the, uh, getting close to the, the actual murder scene itself where the, the victim was found. Where, where was Richard here? And let's talk a little bit about, uh, what this would have looked like. Yeah. So you can see the area there where they're, uh, they're videotaping. So Richard was found right up in that area. There's a, there's a couple large trees. There's a pathway running off to the left of the, uh, 
the picture, the street you can see out to the front of the picture. So we're walking in south into the parkway from Colborne Lodge area. And he was found just up in the treed area there. So um, during the night, as you can see, there's no uh, lamps in there. There's no lighting. There's no um, video. There's there's nothing in there. So at 10 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night on a December evening, it would have been pitch black in that area. So um, Richard would have been probably walking in there with a, a, a female, um, probably trying to... Um, to obtain some sexual services at that point. And he was ambushed, essentially, is what we think happened. We believe that she may have had someone waiting in there. In 1988, crack cocaine was really just starting to take a foothold in Toronto. And the results on people and the way they were acting was very bizarre. It was causing bizarre behavior. It was causing people to need their next fix. It was causing people need to obtain money. So this may have been a time where Richard just finishing work had been given cash. He may have had a large quantity of cash with him. He may have been buying drinks. He may have been going to pay for sexual services. Um, she may have saw a large number of bills in his wallet and said, why don't you meet me there when they walk into the park? He's ambushed. He's stabbed, um, stabbed numerous times. The person that did it may have been high on crack cocaine at the time. As you can see, there was definite overkill in this case. Yeah. And that's what I want to get to next is the, uh, we'll look at the jacket here with all the, the stab wounds. I mean, this is typically an enraged or, or somebody that's not uh, just doing this for a robbery or out of obvious self-defense. This is somebody that is enraged. Yeah, there may have been a number of motives with this. I mean, probably the motive was to obtain the money that he had on him. But when you look at this, I mean, the cause of death was stab wounds to his chest. So once he'd received those fatal stab wounds, he was probably face down. And these wounds are just gratuitous they're just um as you said it's it's someone that's that's not in the right state of mind or jealous maybe of his company with that woman possibly that's that's another possibility um it's just overkill there, there's no reason to stab someone that many times when obviously you wouldn't know but you've stabbed someone in the chest and they're obviously incapacitated at that point so this is just making sure that this person is dead. Yeah, because typically the one or two stab wounds in that general location would probably send someone into shock and then the next one or two would have been a fatal. These ones in the back here, um, really probably at that point, the person wasn't even able to defend themselves. So these were just for, for no reason, essentially. It just lends itself to the killer leaning down on the person and just plunging the knife into their back. And that's what we're going to look at next. So the murder weapon... It's right here. It looks like a fixed knife and it looks like about maybe a four inch blade, five inch blade at most. Um, let's talk about the knife a little bit. It's a standard knife. It doesn't look particularly sharp. Now saying that it may have been driven into some of his bones as well. But one, thing's, one thing about stabbing murders is they're close contact murders. And when you're driving a knife of that length into somebody's body, you're going to hit bone which is going to be resistance. And at that point, it's going to force a knife back onto your hands, which leads us to have DNA from the knife as the person drove it back into their hands and, and would have cut themselves for sure. Yeah, somebody would have been cut stabbing somebody that many times, especially in the back where you're right, you're going to hit bone, you're going to hit some um, some hard uh, parts of the body that are going to release that knife back. And you do have DNA for this right now. We do. We do have offender DNA in this case. So it's just a matter of time till we find this offender. I mean, there's changes in science that have, have come along that are going to help us and we're going to do some testing and, and we're going to bring this person into custody. So Steve, let's talk a little bit about the DNA. What, what has the DNA taught you thus far? So we're just in the infancy of doing the testing of the phenotyping and the genetic testing, but we do know that it is male DNA. So that leads to our theory of he was lured to the park by the female and the male set on him and attacked him and, and 
was the murder. Uh, we're looking at doing further testing where we can determine uh, a lot further on the male, his, uh, his ethnicity, his uh, countries of origin, and hopefully we're able to narrow him down and, and arrest him. From what I understand, uh, there is some information that we're not able to discuss here um, that could potentially be vital to the case um, and cause somebody to really squirm across from you guys shortly. Um, is there anything that we want to tell the individuals who know something about this or perhaps was is the murderer? Well, this was 1988. So these people were probably in their early 20s or maybe even late teens. So their life has completely changed now. They're going to be much older. They're going to have families. They're going to have lives. They're going to have jobs. Whatever they were involved in back then, whether there was crack cocaine, whether it was booze, whether whatever they were on at the time that they did this, maybe out of their lives now. They may have went. They may have got themselves cleaned up. They may be completely out of that lifestyle. So they may be sitting there with a family. They may be sitting there with a great job, uh, a nice house, and they know that this knock is coming at their door and they have a lot more to lose now so the bottom line here is it's going to be much more beneficial to the individuals who are who have knowledge of this and aren't coming forward or the murder um this is going to be a lot better on them if they come forward rather than when that knock does come they're completely guilty with no explanation except they're going to jail and they're going to lose everything that they have right now in their life. There's no excuse for not coming forward anymore. I mean, you can go through our entire cold case website with the changes in science. Now, these are all going to be solved. These people that have thought that they've got away with murder for however long that day's coming where the police are coming to arrest them for these murders that they committed. And they aren't going to have much of an excuse if all of this is out there on the internet. It's on podcasts. It's in the paper. It's on the websites. They know what they did at these times. And there's always explanations for why things happened. And we're willing to listen to those explanations. But the problem is if you don't come forward and we have to come find you, it's a lot harder to explain what happened that night at that point. So you don't want us come knocking at your door. You're better off to give us a call and come in and say, I know things went a little sideways that evening and this is what happened and I'm willing to take responsibility for my actions that night. This comes back to, you know, having empathy and remorse. You know, I think any judge, any homicide detective, people have a lot more respect for somebody that may have made an error, may have made a mistake. Um, there are things that, you know, can be talked about and discussed when you're proactive in being honest and truthful. If you don't come to Toronto Homicide and they kick your door down with ETF, you know, running in there with you and your family, um, you're not only putting your family at risk, um, but you're, you're, you're not being truthful and you are opting to allow a murderer to run free, um, which will not look good on you when you do get caught. And I think it's really important that people know that. Nobody wants that to happen. I mean, you're sitting there with your wife and your your kids and and all of a sudden your door gets blown in and and there's flashbangs in your house because you're a murderer. That's that's a real problem. And your wife may know, your family may know, your friends may know. It's time for them to protect these people's families, these people's coworkers. Um there's a murderer in in your community and and this person needs to be brought to justice. They need to face what they've done. I mean, Richard, by all accounts, great guy. I mean, he, he worked, he, he, you know, he, he lived his life. He wasn't bothering anyone. He went out for a few drinks and he ends up stabbed and murdered in the park and, and his money's taken from him. paying with his life. And, you know, you look back and you think about the family, you know, you think about the life that Richard could have had and it was all taken away that evening. And I think that, um, you know, the, this individual or individuals, we know there's individuals that are involved with this murder, whether they're all going to jail for this or someone's going to help out and the murderer just goes, either way, there's going to be some closure to this at some point and they won't know when it's coming exactly, but it is coming and there are some major developments in all of these cold cases that we've sat and talked about. It's not just this one. All of these with the improvements in DNA, um, it, there is a lot more uh, there's a lot more of a chance that these individuals are going to be caught and go down for what they did. Um, 
I think the last thing that I wanted to to just kind of touch on here that when I look at this, it says he was 28 years old, as we touched on, but I really want to focus on that. This is a 28 year old. And you said he passed away at the hospital or was he uh, deceased in the in the actual park? He was most likely deceased in the park. I mean, obviously, they were able to find a, a faint pulse. Um they tried to rush him to the hospital, but I don't think at the, at this point, we don't know how long he had been staying out there in the cold, suffering from these stab wounds, bleeding out. Um, he was most likely deceased already, but they did everything that they possibly could to get him to the hospital and try to save him. And one other thing that one would obviously ask, and you all, you just touched on it as well, is there is a murderer on the loose. If you are living with this individual who murdered somebody, uh, or you know of this person, they're still involved with your life. What kind of risk does that present to anybody who is, uh, you know, in a close vicinity to somebody that actually was able to stab somebody this many times? Well, I mean, it takes a certain type of person to be able to take someone else's life. I mean, you think of how many people in Canada have actually done that, willfully taken someone else's life. I mean, we're probably in the thousands at the most. So out of 30 million. That's right. It's it's not the average person that can do this. So if you have that sort of rage or that sort of psychopathy, regardless of whether you're intoxicated or you're 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 taking drugs or, you know, you suffer from mental illness, if you're if you have the ability to take someone else's life, then you're a danger. And especially if if you go on acting like life's normal, not admitting to the fact that you took someone else's life you're a ticking time bomb. What what could set you off the next time? You don't know what could set this person off. Yeah. I mean, to anybody that is sitting around this person, I well, I wouldn't want to be sitting around this person. Well, you're putting everybody at risk, their coworkers, their family, their kids, grandkids, whoever it is, whoever they have in their family, whoever they have in their life, their social circles, everybody's being put at risk. It's time for people to step up and talk about what happened here. We know people know it's just a matter of time before they're caught. And again, with this one, there's there's at the very least two people that know what happened that night and probably a lot more. I mean, when you're doing crack cocaine out on the street again, you know, you get high, you talk about things. There's other people that know there's there's people that know who committed this. Maybe at the time they were in in this sort of community where they were doing drugs, they were living that lifestyle. They're not going to say anything at that point. But. There's changes in life. There's changes in science. Uh, people have moved on. People have different lives now. They've moved out of the community. There's no threat to them. This person's not a threat to them. They can come forward. They can do it anonymously. What, what, whatever's, whatever's needed, whatever it takes, you can call us. We'll take the calls. You'll take the calls. Whatever you feel comfortable with, just provide us that name. We can, we can match the DNA up to prove that the person, the name you're giving is our murderer. So we can do that work. Um, autosomal DNA will give us a match that'll show us that this person is definitively the the person that left their DNA on the murder weapon. And I think the other thing to also bring up here, um, in 1988, if you notice somebody that had a larger amount of money than usual, that was a little bit more uh, sharing with some of their drugs and you took part uh, with someone that was kind of, you know, outside of the norm, if there was a female and a male that may have been um, a little bit more generous and had a little bit more money on them than usual, this could also be a great tip. Yeah, I mean, people that come across this sort of money in that sort of community, they're going to share the wealth. Yeah, they're, they're going to buy as much crack cocaine as they and have bring and everybody over. So if you noticed somebody being a little bit more generous and having a party, it could have been on Richard's money, which is blood money, and you should definitely come forward and tell us about that. Yeah, and it's uh, the Parkdale community. So it would have been over in the Parkdale community um, where they would have had this, and they, they probably, like you said, th had thrown a big party. It was, you know, party time for everybody. Where'd you get that? Don't worry about that. The male probably had a cut on his hand. These are all things that could tweak your memory because people people are street savvy. They, yeah. they understand these things. So they know, right. If, if you come and, 
And the usual people that are fighting for $10 to get their next fix now have a couple thousand dollars in their hand and they're buying huge amounts of drugs and booze and partying it up. And they've got cuts on their hands. Hotel room, nicer hotel room. Who knows? Yeah. You're looking at that going, something's not right here. Um, It would have tweaked people at that time, but you know, when you're looking for your next fix, sometimes you overlook those sort of things, but now they're clean. They're out of the lifestyle. It's, it's time to come forward and talk and, and allow us to arrest Richard's murderer. Thanks very much for being with us, uh, Steve. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thanks, Andy. (laughs) 